The Gospel of Matthew says all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. We discussed the 613 pharisaical laws, that there are 248 positive commands, things you should do, and 365 negative commands, the things that you shouldn't do. But these two commandments are the most important. Like if you get these right, everything else kind of falls into place. It's kind of like when you're buttoning your shirt. You get that first button right, and everything else is good, right? But you get that first one wrong, that's 15 seconds. You're never getting back. So as you can see, exactly the same. Thank you. So to love God supremely is to know his commands, follow his teachings, and search out his hearts. Because Christ is in our hearts, we're now an extension of him in this world. And we must be loved to every person we meet. And so today, we're going to do a deeper dive into this phrase, love the Lord. As followers of Christ, we want to love him with the same love that he has for us. So how do we describe that love? Uh, we have a, a kid's storybook Bible. Uh, I don't know if, if anybody else uses this, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Any parents out there use the Jesus Storybook Bible? Uh, it's a great uh, Bible. It, it speaks things in a very kid-friendly way, but also, you know, you're doing the Bible story with them, and you're like, man, I'm learning stuff too. Like, I should have known that, but that's, that's really good. And the way it describes God's love is God loves you with a never-stopping, never-giving-up, unbreaking, always and forever love. It's a love that shows commitment, compassion, care, selflessness. It requires unwavering devotion. Uh, my wife and I got married uh, in 2003. We were 21 and 22. I was 21, she was 22. So as you can see, I married up in every way possible. If you, if you met her last week, you'd agree with that. Um, I know her better now than I did then. Um, I remember being on our honeymoon and, and waking up one night to her flying out of bed and saying, Scott, the radio is on. And okay. It, the valiant husband, I'm going to run around this house and find the radio. And so I'm running everywhere, and I can't find a radio. And so I come back to the bedroom, and she's dead asleep. And so the next morning, uh, I asked her, I said, well, I, I, I really tried to find that radio. I don't know what happened. And she had no idea what I was talking about. And finally she said, oh, yeah, forgot to tell you, sometimes I talk in my sleep. <laughs> And so that was the beginning of what else am I going to learn along the way, you know? Uh, there have been nights where she's dove over me to catch the kids that are falling out of the bed, that are safely in their beds. Uh, she's been standing on our bed trying to save them from the ceiling fan because I wasn't willing to do it. Um, when I agreed to marry her, I knew for the most part what I was getting myself into. I knew who she was. I knew her character. I knew that she may be better. She still does. That's where you go, aww. I mean, she might be watching the live stream. It's Mother's Day. Come on. You've got you to gotta help me out here. No matter what comes our way, because of the love I have for her, we can do anything. I'm fully devoted and committed to our marriage. And the same is true with Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we have to have an unwavering devotion that acknowledges first and foremost that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is Lord. The scripture passage today, Matthew 16, Jesus poses some powerful questions to his disciples, but they're questions we need to be able to answer as well. So let's read that together. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. He has two questions in here. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And who do you say that I am? So let's pray and then we're going to talk about that. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the challenge that it gives to us. 
And I'm thankful for these questions today, for us to be able to search out not just what people think about you, what other people think about you, but what do we think? How do we acknowledge you? How do we recognize you? Help us today to recognize you as Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Jesus asked, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples respond by saying some people believe the Son of Man to be John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm stunned when I'm reading the Bible. I mean, how do these people not get it, right? I mean, all the people that Jesus is meeting, he's interacting with, he's performing miracles, he's healing people. How is it possible they don't recognize him? How do they miss it? And yet, we live in a culture where the same thing happens. People miss it. See, when you grow up in the church, you know Jesus. It's a foregone conclusion that we believe that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. That he was a real person. He walked in real places. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a nursery rhyme. But it's so easy to forget that not everyone grew up in church. I remember in our first church in, in Highland, Indiana, that uh, there were some kids playing out in the parking lot one day, and we had the, the front door open, and um, they wanted to come in to, to get a drink. So they came in, and, uh, and the senior pastor went out to, to greet them, and one of the kids made their way into the sanctuary, and they came right down front, and we had uh, like a communion table set up, and we had a nativity scene on that table. And when the pastor walked into the sanctuary, the, the kid was just standing there staring at that nativity scene. So the pastor came up next to him, and he said, who's that? And he's pointing at baby Jesus. And the pastor said, well, that's, that's baby Jesus. And the kid said, who's that? He had never heard. He didn't know. We buy into the deception that everyone knows the story of Jesus. I mean, we acknowledge that there are people in other countries that don't know the story of Jesus. That's why we send missionaries, right? To tell the story. But not in the United States. There's a church on every corner. How is it possible? While it's true that opportunities abound all around us for people to know who Jesus is, if they've never been invited, if someone has never been asked the question, if someone has never been told... How are they supposed to know? Romans 10 says it this way, How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how, how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. How many people do we rub shoulders with every day that have no idea who Jesus is? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Some have no idea. Uh, some have an idea or an interpretation or a perception of who Jesus is. Um, some people look at the Bible and say, that's not good enough. That's just made up. Somebody else wrote, wrote that. And so uh, there are actual historical accounts that Jesus lived and breathed. He walked on this earth. Around the year A.D. 94, there was a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. Thank you. That's good. I, I was ready to go again, you know. Could have made it happen. Do you mean to do anything with the pack, or are you good? All right. Um, so we've got uh, the biblical account, but for some people that's not enough. And so we've got historical accounts. There are actually uh, two places where we can find historians that have talked about Jesus. Around the year A.D. 94, there was a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus who mentioned Jesus' name twice in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews. He wrote, and there arose around this time Jesus, a wise man, if indeed we should call him a man. For he was a doer of marvelous deeds, a teacher of men who received the truth with pleasure. Josephus also documented how a man named James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, and certain others were brought before the Sanhedrin. About 20 years later, Tacitus, a Roman historian, wrote a book surveying the history of Rome. And in it he described how Nero punished with every refinement the notoriously depraved Christians, as they were popularly called. He went on to write that their originator, Christ, had been executed in Tiberius' reign by the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. 
Along with historical accounts, many different religions exist. In case you didn't know that, thought I'd let you know. You're welcome. Here's what some of them have to say about Jesus. Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus was not God, but he was God's first creation. Jesus is God's son and is inferior to God. They reject the idea of the Trinity and that Jesus was fully God and fully man. In Scientology, they deny the deity of Christ and said of having a biblical view of who Christ is and what he did, they assigned to him the characteristics of some sort of lesser God who's obtained legendary status over the years. In Baha'i, Jesus was a manifestation of God, just like Krishna or Buddha or Muhammad. Each manifestation was stronger than the prior one because they had more life experience and they were inferior to those that came after them. These manifestations were not an incarnation. God could not be incarnated, so Jesus is one of many who's simply a reflection of God. In Buddhism, he was a wise and enlightened man, but he was not divine, has no place in Buddhist teachings. In Islam, Jesus is a prophet sent by God. They believe in a virgin, miraculous birth. However, he was not the son of God. They do not believe that he was killed on a cross and resurrected. Lots of voices almost sounds like lots of options. We like options nowadays, right? And in a culture where there's no absolute truth, we're faced with the challenge of staying committed and wholly devoted to God. One thing that can help us maintain true north is by investing ourselves in the reading of God's word. That's our foundation. There's no better place to search out the question of who is Jesus than by looking at his own words, his life, his testimony that are found in scriptures. It's important that we know our Bible, that we know what Jesus said about himself. Have you ever been in a, a Bible study? Probably not here. I can't imagine this would ever happen here. But you've been in a Bible study where somebody throws out a phrase that sounds biblical, but it's not quite biblical. Like, cleanliness is next to godliness. Not quite God helps those that help themselves. God will never give you more than you can handle. This too shall pass. I mean, we like those phrases. They look great on a coffee mug, right? They give us the warm fuzzies. But putting words into God's mouth is a pretty dangerous practice. We mislead ourselves and others when we do this. We need to know what Jesus said about himself. Because if Jesus didn't claim to be God, Christians shouldn't say that he is. If Jesus didn't say that he could forgive sins, Christians shouldn't ask him for forgiveness. If Jesus didn't say that he could answer prayers, Christians shouldn't pray to him. So what did Jesus say about himself? Jesus came down from heaven. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus lived before he came into human history on earth. He's eternally God. Home for him was heaven, is heaven, and coming to earth was a downward journey for him. Muhammad supposedly took a trip to heaven. Joseph Smith had a vision. We have lots of people who have testified to out-of-body experiences where they see the gates of heaven. But no one but Jesus began in heaven came down to earth, and then returned to heaven. Jesus said he was sinless. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? It's a pretty big statement to claim to be without sin. Some could see it as a pretty arrogant claim to say they're without sin. I mean, sin includes thoughts, words, motives, deeds, sins of omission not doing what we're supposed to do, or sins of commission, doing the things we're not supposed to do. Jesus is free of all of this. Thoughts, motives, actions. It's pretty amazing, unparalleled statement. Jesus said that he and the Father are one, a claim that he is God. And he showed that authority in so many ways, by performing miracles, by forgiving sins, he healed the sick. Sometimes he did kind of a combination. Forgive you of your sins, just to prove it, get up and walk. I mean, he, he was a combo guy, too. 
Jesus said he would rise from the dead. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. Twice Jesus states that he would be handed over, judged, killed, and then would rise from the dead. And Jesus said he is the only way to the Father. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one sees God but through me. No one experiences restored relationship with God but through me. So who do you say I am? Peter offers a, a pretty bold response. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. We talked last week about the teacher who asked what is the greatest commandment, that he commended Jesus' answer and agreed with him. And Jesus' response was, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Peter's able to do something here that the teacher could not. He's able to recognize that the person he's following is the true and the living God. I was watching a, a documentary on John Wesley recently because I'm cool. So if you, uh, if you ever hear in the Church of the Nazarene where we talk about Wesleyan roots or Wesleyan theology, that's who we're talking about is John Wesley. And, uh, and Wesley was an interesting guy, very well educated. I went through all the training he, he needed to to, to be a, a pastor. And, uh, and yet through it all, there was a disconnect for him. And he was on a trip from England to the United States, and they came up on a really, really bad storm. He was terrified, thought he was going to die. And so he went down below deck, and he found this group of Moravian Christians who were singing. They were singing hymns. They were in a Bible study. They were praying. And he's looking at them going, do you not understand what's happening right now? We're all going to die. But they had peace because of where they were at with God. And so uh, it struck him. He, he, he realized they had something he didn't. Even in his meticulous observance and obedience to the word of God, something was missing. They had an assurance that he didn't have. So it moves on to a, a scene where he meets with this teacher, Augustus Spangenberg. And the teacher says to him, do you know that Jesus Christ is your savior? And he says, yes, I know that Jesus is the savior of the world. No, do you know that you are saved? Well, I hope he has died to save me. Do you know yourself? And he stumbled before finally saying, yes, I do. But you could tell he didn't. Through all Wesley's training, education, ministry, he struggled to take the knowledge and experiences that he had and translate them to his own personal salvation. On May 24th in 1738, that changed for him. Wesley went to a, a Moravian meeting on Aldersgate Street, and he claimed there for himself the assurance of salvation that he had sought. He would write later in his diary, he felt his heart strangely warmed. I felt as I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. From there, Wesley's life and ministry changed forever. Making it personal can be a tough journey for us. I mean, I, I get why, why Jesus would say Barry, you know. I, I get why Jesus would say Rich. I, I, I get why Jesus would do that for, for certain people, but me? To put it on myself? To know how it's, man, that... It's not just about understanding scripture. It's not just about obeying all the rules. It's not about being worthy. None of us is worthy. It's about accepting the gift that God has given us in Jesus Christ. And so the question comes to you, have you accepted it? Have you acknowledged Jesus as Messiah, Son of God, Savior, because we each have to answer the question, who do you say I am? Jesus' response to Peter is, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. When we demonstrate unwavering devotion to God, he gives unwavering devotion to us. He'll be with you through it all. There's nothing that you're going to go through where you're going to be alone. You're in the palm of his hands. This church is in the palm of his hands. So as we close today, recognizing that Jesus, he's a lot of things. I mean, he proved that in scripture. He's healer, he's sustainer, he's provider. He was a financial advisor. Uh, he was a food multiplication specialist. At the wedding in Cana of Galilee, he won best bartender. Can I say that? Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. I don't know if I can say that. Forget that one. Oh, we're live streaming. I can't edit it out either. Above all of these other roles, first and foremost, he's Savior. He's Redeemer. He's the giver of grace. He's your restorer. Who do you say Jesus is? Is he above everything else your Savior, or is he more of a kind of a genie in a bottle? When you need something, you go to him. When things aren't going well, you go to him. You try to experience the favor of God without the commitment. But it's probably not working out too well. To love the Lord with unwavering devotion is to recognize who he is and what he's done. And in gratitude, we give ourselves to him and we follow him. So I want to offer you an opportunity to respond today in a couple of ways. Uh, this might be the first time you've heard any of this before. You could be maybe that person that's walked into a church building today just because you heard about it. Maybe you needed a drink of water and you find yourself in the sanctuary going, who is this? Jesus that you're talking about. And you want to make a commitment to follow him. Maybe you find yourself more like John Wesley. You know all the stories. You've been in the church your whole life. There's a disconnect. It's never been made personal for you. You've never been able to answer the question, who do you say I am? With an answer of, my Savior. My Messiah. So I want to invite everyone to, to bow their heads. And um, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to ask that everybody in this room say this prayer. And the reason for that is um, no one should ever pray alone. It could be there's somebody sitting next to you that desperately needs to take a step today. But they know if they say this prayer by themselves, somebody's going to hear them. And so by us praying together, we're going to be an encouragement. We're going to be a body of believers today. So I invite you to pray this with me. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. You died on the cross so I could be forgiven. You rose from the dead so I could be set free. I commit to follow you all of the days of my life. And from this moment forward, I'm never turning back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now if you look at me again, if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, uh, we don't want to leave you here unequipped. Because it's a journey, right? It's a journey that we go on. And so I'm going to hang out here down near the front. And if you want to come and talk to me about that, I'd love for you to do so. If, um, 
If you prayed that prayer as a rededication and you want to talk about that, I'd love to talk to you as well. Who do you say Jesus is? I invite you today to go in the power and the peace in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are dismissed.